Howdy folks, welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Thursday, June the 23rd, 2016. And I have the very distinct honor and great pleasure of welcoming back to the show, Mr. Bill Holter, who is a member of the Holter Sinclair Collaboration, which can be found over at jsmindset.com. Bill, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Rory. Well, I certainly appreciate you being here and taking some time out of your day. And uh, gold, silver, the miners, they've all been enjoying a nice run during the first half of the year, Bill. And we're headlong into what is turning out to be a very nasty uh, election season. And Trump or Hillary, which one would you see as a better fit for the precious metals and the miners? I don't think it matters. Doesn't matter? No, I think uh, mathematically the supply, demand, the, the derivatives outstanding that are going to blow up, they're already in place. Uh, I've said this before, I, and I'm sorry to say this, but I don't think that, uh, I think if Donald Trump gets close, he'll probably be assassinated. You're not the first one I to say just, that. I just don't see the powers that be. If he truly is an outsider, I can't see them allowing him inside. I, I kind of see him. There's There's been quite a bit of talk uh, recently about him being uh, a Trojan horse, and I'm kind of leaning in that direction. I don't really see him, see him as an outsider. I mean, he's been hanging out with these guys and cutting deals in the back room with them for a very long time. So, uh, well, uh, we'll see. Yes, it, it, it's it's going to be interesting over the next few months. The date, uh, the debates will certainly be interesting. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be some good entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Janet Yellen's been out uh, the past couple of weeks, and has the has the has the Federal Reserve Bill, have they lost all credibility at this point? And as I ask in a, in a recent article, is there anybody out there listening whenever Janet approaches the podium? Well, she, ha- she really has nothing to say because there's nothing they can do. They cannot raise interest rates. And, I mean, you can't have the world's reserve currency running a negative interest rate. So there's, there's really nothing the fed can do. They're already, they're, they're in a corner. So you don't see, you don't see them being able, having the ability to, to implement negative interest rates, even though they've been talking about that. Uh, they can try, but again, the dollar is the world's reserve currency. How do you have a negative interest rate on the world's reserve currency? I mean, that's the admission and absolute admission of failure. So they can say whatever they want. It ain't going to happen. I've, I've spoken about this before. If you have a negative interest rate scenario, that means that debt is better than a currency that it promises to pay, which is the same thing as, for instance, backwardation in silver. Gold or silver cannot be worth uh, more today than they are three months or six months out because you can earn interest on the gold or silver for the three months or the six months. And backwardation is, is either showing real physical tightness in the market, or it's showing that traders are no longer believing in the rule of law. In other words, they don't trust that they're going to get their gold or silver delivered to them in three to six months, so they'd rather have it in hand now. And you can make that comparison to uh, negative interest rates where debt, which is supposed to be discounted, basically discounted currency. How is it possible that the debt itself is worth more or, or valued higher than the currency that it promises to pay? Doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense. It can't be. And it especially can't be when you're talking about the world's reserve currency. No, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, I've been questioning this or been a little bit confused about how 
they would be able to to pull off a negative interest rate. It just doesn't. What you just said, Bill, makes makes perfect sense. And speaking of uh, tightness in the gold and silver market, uh, the the COMEX and the ETFs, uh, the paper gold, they've been making a lot of noise lately. And with all of this gold that's flowing into, or supposed gold flowing into the uh, ETFs, these paper instruments, do you see the COMEX and ETFs as carrying weight in the physical market? And if so, how much? And if not, why why wouldn't they? Well, I don't think that the uh, I my personal opinion is that the ETFs are not actually purchasing real gold. It, it's not uh, it's not real metal. We've seen a huge increase in the open interest in gold and in silver on the COMEX, and that's that open interest has basically just been short selling. It's been used to dilute the price. Now, very interesting for the last two months, for the first time, as far as I know, in probably in our lifetime, gold is actually flowing into London as opposed to flowing out of London for the last two months. And it's been coming in from Switzerland. I wanted to ask you about that because I just found out this morning uh, about that situation. And apparently the gold is actually originating in Saudi Arabia. In Right. And well, not me. It, it's, yeah, the UAE, the Saudis, uh, and that's a function of, I guess, they're needing, you know, because the price of oil is, has been so low, they're, they're bleeding from a cash standpoint and need cash. So they're just selling their gold back into the open market. And for, do you have any indication once it arrives uh, in London? its destination, I mean, because what I've been told is that it's going west, that it's coming into either the London market or the U.S. market. Are you seeing indications uh, of that as well? Yeah, I, I don't have any idea. Uh, I just know that the import numbers, for two months now, uh, London has imported gold and they never import gold. Yeah, that's that's definitely a a change because for the past couple of years, I believe they've it's been flowing out of London into oh into for the Switch. past twenty plus years. Twenty plus years, okay. Yeah, it's been it's gold nearly always flows out of London. And the Brexit vote is going on today. There's been lots and lots of uh, commentary about it for the past couple of weeks and this week in particular. And why should we believe, Bill, why should we believe the outcome of the Brexit vote when there's been so much now proven in a court of law rigging of so many financial markets? I mean, if they can rig these, you know, like the LIBOR and the Forex, which are gargantuan markets. I mean, if they yeah, can rig that. All they need that, is an eraser. What's that? All they need is an eraser. Well, there you go. They erase the check mark and replace the check mark. Uh, my guess is that it will be remain, uh, but if you look at at the European Union, it's doomed. I mean, you've got Italy thinking the same thing. You've got Spain talking about the same thing. Even France, uh, if Le Pen were to win, France will go through a through an exit referendum or exit strategy. Uh, you just have to, to look and see what is going on economically and financially. And, you know, whether it's this year, or next year, or five years from now, uh, the EU will break up, in my opinion. I kind of agree with that. I mean, I think that, you know, even with the, the situation in Germany, I mean, one could make the argument with the nationalist on the rise there in light of all of the immigrants that Merkel has agreed to unleash on the citizens of that country i mean they're they're sick of it i mean people all over europe are are sick of this whole experiment that has cost them dearly i mean not just money but or their wealth it's cost them well, it's so cost much them more. socially yes right, it's costing them socially if you look at it from a nuts and bolts standpoint from when they originally formed the eu it was doomed from that point because you're talking about what is it, 26 different nations, and you've got uh, 
basically different economies, some that are strong and some that are weak. I mean, how, how can monetary policy work for all 26 nations? It's going to be pushing and pulling. In other words, uh, it's going to drag on some and, and help others. So there's, there's no way, uh, there's no way long term to be able to support all, all 26 nations because they're all going to have diverse needs. And what you do for one group is going to harm another group. Isn't that kind of what we're seeing here in, in the United States as well? I mean, we have a centralized monetary policy and we're kind of seeing that same dynamic play out here. It's taken a really long time for it to manifest and with lots of manipulation and nonsense coming from the Federal Reserve who sets the monetary policy. But aren't we really seeing the same thing play out here that is that has taken a, just a very short period of time to play out in, in the European Union? Or am I way off uh, base here? Well, yeah, what you're really what I think you're, you're seeing play out on Main Street is what Ross Perot talked about back in 91, 92, the, the giant sucking sound. Yep. Um, we've lost manufacturing, we've lost jobs. I mean, you can't pay a, a floor sweeper at a General Motors factory $27 an hour when somebody who actually does something, you know, creates something, real labor in Mexico or Indonesia or wherever, is willing to work for $5 a day or, or whatever. Uh, it's, it's an equalization of, of labor. And that's, the result has been, we no longer make anything in the, the real jobs, the good jobs uh, that, that created products are gone. Do you think that, that Trump and some of his policies would be able to reverse that? I mean, he's, that's been no. at the top of his list. Yeah, I, it is on the top of his list, but to answer your question, no. Nothing can reverse it. That's what I was thinking as well. It's I mean, arbitrage. It's labor arbitrage is what it is. There's nothing anybody can do about it. That that makes perfect sense. Uh, and silver, uh, silver has been kind of holding on pretty strong. It's like I said earlier, it's made a, a nice move this year. And what is, what is your analysis showing for the for the summer and and into the fall with silver? I mean, is it is that market going to tighten up? I mean, I know right now the uh, U.S. Mint has has stopped. I believe they've completely stopped the uh, ration sales of the of the Eagles, and the wholesalers have uh, begun dumping their current inventory into the market and slashing the premiums. I mean, do you what kind of an effect do you think that that's going to have over the course of the of the remainder of this year? Well, that can, can change overnight. The, in other words, the, the no more rationing, that, that can be changed by the time you wake up the next morning. Well, that's so, true. yeah, that's what's going on right now. Um, I, I want to switch gears a little bit toward what's happening or has happened uh, on COMEX. We've seen uh, March, April, and May, there were roughly... Uh, 17 tons of gold that I Harvey Organ keeps a running tally yes. of, of the movements on COMEX and it looks like there's 17 tons that have not been delivered on yet and there's 49 tons standing for delivery in June which that would be the biggest delivery I believe ever uh, the interesting thing is there's also 4,000, it's, it's over 4,000 contracts. So you're talking about uh, over 400,000 ounces of gold standing for delivery, or not standing, but still open for delivery uh, for July. And that's, that's absolutely huge. July is basically a nothing month that nobody trades in. There's no interest in it. Nobody ever stands for gold that amount has increased. It was just a couple of weeks ago that it was under uh, 3,000 contracts. Now it's over 4,000 contracts. 
and we saw this for the first time in May, which was also a nothing month. Uh, and they actually had, I, the first notice day was five and a half tons. And by the end of the month, they were up to 6.8 tons. So the bleed down that we've seen in the past where there's a, a certain amount standing, but it just goes away. And, and the only logical explanation is they were paid premiums to go away and not take the delivery. That's not happening anymore. In fact, what's happening is there's more gold standing at the end of the month than there is at the beginning of the month. Uh, there's a huge amount of contracts open for uh, for August. I think it's it's like 38 million ounces. I mean, you're talking about wow. 1,100 or 1,200 tons of gold. That's half of the global production. And on the on silver, you've got uh, and I didn't see the number yesterday, but I think it was somewhere around 450 million ounces of silver for that were still open for uh, for July. Uh, that's over half. You know, global production is what 800, 850 million ounces. Right. So it looks to me like this thing could come to a head. Uh, whether it does or not, I don't know. But I can tell you something very big has changed. And it, it bears keeping a very close eye on what's going on in COMEX because this is a, a stark change from from the past. That is a, that is a big change. And I know that uh, about a week or so ago, Harvey was reporting that every day there was new uh, delivery contracts that were actually being added to right, exactly. the June uh, contract. And it was like, right. okay, that's really weird. I mean, and I don't think anything like that has ever happened before, has it, Bill? It happened in May for the first time. Okay. It happened in May. Uh, like I said, May is a literally a, a zero. Last year, there was 2,500 ounces, so it's less than one-tenth of a ton that actually took delivery in May. And this year, first notice day was 5.5 tons, and by the end of the month, contracts were added every single day except for two days where they remained the same and they ended the month at 6.8 tons it was something like 210 or 212,000 ounces that's incredible compared to 2500 last year that's a very very significant change and do you right. think it's that a, it's you... a huge change in in amount of ounces but it's also a huge change in the fact that your typical month your typical delivery month in the past on Comex you'd end up seeing 10, 12, 15 tons standing for delivery. And by the end of the month, there would only be six, eight, maybe 10 tons that actually stood for delivery. It would always bleed down. Right. And it never made sense because if you're open on first notice day, you've got to fund your account 100% to take delivery. If you went through the trouble of, of putting the cash up to take delivery, why would you possibly walk away and not take delivery? The only logical reason is because you were paid a premium to do so, and you accepted the premium, so you dropped your contract. But now that's not happening. Now, during the month, after first notice day, more and more contracts are being opened and standing for delivery and not going away. Now, there's there's two major changes in the dynamics of gold that have recently manifested. And we discussed one just a moment ago, Bill, as far as gold flowing out of Switzerland and into London. Right. And the other are these uh, very prominent, very well-known on a global scale uh, investors that are moving into gold, whether it's the ETFs or physical gold or a combination to me, that's not as important as the fact that they are, in fact, moving towards gold. What what role do you think that these two new dynamics play in what we're currently discussing about the COMEX? I mean, is it possible that they're pulling the gold out of Saudi Arabia or the UAE into uh, the COMEX to make these deliveries uh, for these these big time investors, or I mean, am I just if I just yeah, wandered out into the weeds? The big time investors are not going to buy their gold. 
through Comex. Okay. That's uh, because it's not it's not really a delivery hub, uh, and they would certainly be be persuaded not to do that because just look at the amount of gold or, or silver available for delivery. Um, you're you're not even talking you're talking maybe a billion five total on on COMEX for gold and silver that's available to deliver. So it's not the gold and silver is not there to be delivered. Uh, but you're right, there's some very big names. I mean George Soros, Carl Icahn, uh, Gundlach, Druckenmiller, go on right right out down the line. They're all talking about a collapse coming, and they're all collectively basically saying that your protection is gold. That's your insurance policy. I mean, whether they're pulling it out of the COMEX or not, I mean, I would think that that's influencing the activities that are happening on the COMEX and the people that, like you were saying a minute ago, it, it only makes sense that they were taking premiums before to uh, close their contract. They're saying, well... Uh, not not this month. I, I want I want the actual product. Well, Rory, Rory, my theory is, and it, 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 this has been my theory for the last couple of years, okay. that the very stubborn uh, open interest that refuses to drop in silver, and now these longs that refuse to go away, they are from Asia. These they, mm. these are Asian proxies. Okay. I, in other words, I wrote an article a couple of years ago called Kill Switch. Uh, and it was my theory, and, and still is, that China has their finger on a kill switch by owning these contracts. And, and at any point in time, when they come into the delivery month, if they decide to flip the, the kill switch, they can do it by just saying, send us the metal. Because they know they know that they control more metal than can be delivered. Okay. How does the uh, SGE play out in, in that, in, in what you just described? As far as the, the Shanghai Gold Exchange with their yuan fix, I mean, does that play a part in the in the kill switch theory? Well, I think the SGE, and first off, that's basically a uh, a cash and carry market. Yes. And it's been my belief since they announced that they were gonna gonna do a, a cash market that China wants more control or control of pricing gold. And silver, uh, and in a in a cash market, you're you're putting up 100 percent margin as opposed to Comex. You know what is it, five uh, percent or whatever the number happens to be. I know they just increase the margins, but you can control the price of gold and the price of silver if you have lots of dollars. In other words, if you have a lot of cash, you can put it up as margin, and you can sell or buy or do whatever you want and push the price around. And we've seen that many times. We've seen it, you know, you see uh, 10 days worth of global production sold in five or 10 minutes. And that's just a function of somebody has cash to put up for margin to sell contracts. It's not that they have actual gold or actual silver to sell. And a cash market, the SGE, that will set price as opposed to COMEX. How much longer do you think that we have before, before they overwhelm? before the, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the SGE, before it just says, okay, enough is enough. I mean, has that come in this uh, year? Well, I'm, I'm asking for a crystal ball answer, and that, that's yeah, really who knows? not fair. <laughs> uh, the only thing I can tell you is once China does, orders gold or, or tries to buy or have gold or silver delivered to them, and it doesn't, it doesn't get delivered, that's game over. In other words... If they if they ask for delivery and they don't get delivery and delivery can't be made, then it's game over. Then then the cash markets will rule the pricing of gold and silver, and that will coincide with with a, a derivatives meltdown because everything's a promise right now, and once a promise is broken, then all promises are going to be questioned. Everything comes unglued. Right. Confidence will break. Yep. And and just like when I started the, the show out asking you about the Federal Reserve and their credibility, I mean, I think that, that we're starting to see the, the foundation of that confidence really beginning to uh, crumble at this point. I mean, they, exactly. You know, it's 
So we have all of these different dynamics that are coming into into focus at this point. And, you know, two years ago we were calling them black swans and now they're just, you know, part of the landscape, you know, as far as the Brexit and the Fed's credibility, what's happening with the COMEX, what's happening with the SGE, all of these these items that we didn't see a couple of years ago, like I said, now they are they are very much part of the landscape. And it's not a very pretty picture that I'm looking at at all. Well, Rory, let me finish with this. The entire system is the black swan. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I do. And that that is... It's the whole system. It's not a, you know, it's not Brexit. It's, it's, it's not a single event being the black swan. The whole system is a black swan. The whole system that everyone believes in and you know believes is credible it's the entire system is the black swan that actually makes perfect sense <laughs> because that is that's just, that's about the long and short of it right there because the whole thing is going to is going to implode at some point i mean it, it just it has to i mean it, there has to be a change that's what i keep saying there has to be a change well, we're starting to see some. We're starting to see some changes. Yes, we are. And, Bill, I certainly the appreciate... Wind is shifting. What's that? The wind is shifting. The wind is shifting. And, Bill, I certainly appreciate all your time this morning. I'm going to let you get back to your day. And I appreciate the time, the knowledge, and the, and the wisdom that you've shared with our audience. And we've been speaking with Mr. Bill Holter who is 50% of the Holter-Sinclair collaboration. And you can find all of Bill's work over at jsmindset.com. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. My pleasure.